that concludes members' business. We now move on to portfolio questions, and we start with environment, climate change, and land reform. And we start with question number one from Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle plastic pollution in Scotland's seas. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government recognises the seriousness of the global challenge of plastics in our seas. In conjunction with over 40 actions identified in our marine litter strategy, we have prioritised tackling marine plastics in our programme for government with four commitments to establish a deposit return scheme to increase recycling rates and reduce littering, to establish an expert panel to consider environmental charges for disposable items such as coffee cups, we have committed £500,000 to begin to address litter sinks around the coast and to develop policy to address marine plastics, which will involve working with community groups. And we will host an international conference in 2019 to discuss improving our marine environment and protecting our wildlife focusing on marine plastics. We are introducing a ban on the manufacture and sale of rinse-off personal care products containing plastic microbeads with the rest of the UK, which is expected to be in place 9th July 2018. And we've also recently pledged our support of the Global, Gear, the Global Ghost Gear Initiative to ensure that the issue of loss or abandoned fishing gear, often made of plastics, is addressed around the world. Maurice Corrie. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. It is clear that the UK Government is taking the lead in the fight against the scourge of plastic waste in our oceans. And I'm sure we've all seen the scenes in Blue Planet recently, that documentary, which so vividly highlighted the damage plastic pollution causes to marine life. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to working with the UK Government constructively in the light of the ban on microbeads and consider how charges on single-use plastic items could help to reduce waste? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I thank uh, Maurice Corrie for that follow-up, although I think you'll find that Michael Gove is on record as saying that there is a lot England could learn from the more ambitious approach that Wales and Scotland take on environmental issues. So, of course, we support any initiative that the UK government wants to take in respect of this. And uh, I hope that they will follow us in a number of the things that we are uh, discussing. And I, I am aware of the recent statement by Michael Gove on this. Uh, I am conscious that he is asking for a task force uh, uh, to look at environmental taxes. Uh, uh, Maurice Corey will know that such taxes are not devolved uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this parliament, uh, which is why we were uh, more careful in our use of the word charges and levies rather than taxes. But of course I welcome any moves. This is a global uh, problem and it will require a global effort. Kate Forbes. An MSP who represents east and west coastlines and who thinks that urgent action is required to reduce ocean plastics, does the government agree with me that urgent action is required to crack down, particularly on single-use disposable plastics like straws, cotton buds and cutlery, which all have environmentally friendly alternatives, considering the government has taken the lead on changing behaviour through, for example, plastic bag charges? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do, which is why we uh, indicated in the programme for government that we were uh, going to look very uh, closely at single-use items. And uh, while coffee cups tend to be the one most often referred to, there are a great many other items made of plastic, uh, as we have all seen if we were watching Blue Planet, that can have an enormously damaging effect uh, on, uh, the, uh, uh, on our seas. Um, so, um, yes, I, I do think that all of the options that are open to us should be looked at very, very carefully. It's why we flagged it up in the programme for government uh, and uh, we are considering a, a number of possible options that we can take forward uh, within that context. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I recognise the work that the Scottish Government and Zero Waste Scotland and others are doing um, on this very serious issue of marine litter and particularly plastics. Uh, last week, along with um, members of all parties, I attended the Clean Beach Scotland uh, reception and it was truly inspiring um, what art can do to support uh, communities and others in, in this work. Marine um, Conservation Society, FIDRA, Scottish Fishermen's Federation and Harbour Masters um, from my region and elsewhere were involved along with others and I wonder what work the um, Cabinet Secretary can highlight to ensure that all the partners are inclusively involved as we go forward. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are in uh, an almost constant dialogue with uh, just about all potential stakeholders uh, and I too am struck by the extent to which this has become 
uh, something that people understand at almost every level in society now. Uh, and I would have to say that even before Blue Planet, um, we were aware that, for example, many young children in schools have been, uh, uh, have been coming to an understanding of the damage that this is causing. Uh, I know that uh, uh, schools like Sunnyside Primary School, Ocean Defenders, have been set up, and uh, I'm aware that they have uh, uh, begun to uh, work on a campaign of nay straw at all, uh, plastic straws, and I guess that is one example of the many, many items that we could be looking at. Um, so we are working with absolutely everybody. The work that the uh, various organisations that the member uh, um, uh, flags up is incredibly important, uh, but it needs to be backed up by both uh, government and global action, because however, uh, however uh, strongly people feel about it and whatever the work they do locally, uh, without that global and government backup, um, it will continue to not be sufficient. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Having hosted an event in Holyrood last August on behalf of the X Expedition, an all-female round Britain expedition examining plastic pollution in our seas, I'm delighted the Scottish Government is working hard to decrease such pollution. Will the Government fund further research into the impact of toxins found in plastic entering the food chain and how that can be diminished? Well, the member will have heard my comments about single-use items um, and the, the, the work that is beginning to go in to, to, to look at them. Um, uh, I think uh, Marine Scotland Science has researched already the uptake of toxic pollutants by microplastics um, and their bioavailability in, uh, to species in the food chain. But they also work with, and, and in a sense this is also an answer to Claudia Beamish, because Marine Scotland is also working with MASTS, the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology for Scotland, co-chairing the microplastics group, which includes Harriet Watt University, that is researching the impact of these toxins from microplastics. So the member uh, can be assured that we are uh, aware of the concern, aware of the problem, uh, and we are working uh, uh, to see what can be done to decrease that pollution. And the constituency MSP for Sunnyside Primary School, Ivan McKee. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. I'm glad to hear the Cabinet Secretary recognise the work of Sunnyside Primary School Ocean Defenders in my Glasgow province constituency and the work they're doing on their Nay Straws at All campaign. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this shows that everyone has got a role in marine conservation, not just the place, those constituencies that have beaches? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's really important because there will be a tendency uh, uh, on everybody's part to assume that it is those coastal communities that somehow have more responsibility than others. But the truth of the matter is that we know that it's not necessarily populations in coastal communities that can be creating the biggest problem for our seas. The health of our seas and oceans is absolutely essential uh, for everybody's health and welfare. Uh, whether they live on the coast or inland. And I want to reiterate my, uh, um, how impressive Sunnyside Primary's Nestor at All campaign uh, is because it does send out exactly the right message. It, it, it highlights something that is unnecessary and wasteful uh, when it comes to single-use items. Um, and, it, and it flags up that that's the kind of behaviour uh, that must change. And it's innovative and creative. And it's coming from young people who, of course, are our future. So, um, you know, we are looking very hard uh, where and in what way we will be able to legislate uh, uh, to reduce uh, single-use items, uh, such as the one that uh, is being uh, uh, flagged up by Sunnyside Primary School. Um, and I hope that uh, the continued uh, um, support from across the chamber is something that we can count on as we move forward. Thank you. Question number two, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking in light of concerns raised by COSLA regarding local authorities not being able to register all of their properties on the Land Register of Scotland by 2019. Um, uh, I, I should point out that this um, is perhaps a question that might have been more properly put to the Cabinet Secretary for Econ Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, who is responsible for um, the Land Register. I can, however, uh, advise the member that progress is being made by public sector bodies, uh, including local authorities, to meet the 2019 target a number of local authorities have voluntarily registered land assets and Registers of Scotland have established a team of advisors dedicated specifically to supporting this task. We recognise it's a challenging target and we remain committed to working with local authorities on this matter. Liz Smith. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response and I note the comment about to whom it should be addressed. Nonetheless, COSLA has highlighted the issues with resources that can be leading to delay. 
meaning that that 2019 deadline it will likely prove too much of a challenge given the number of titles which need to be added to the register. Could, could I ask the Scottish Government and her colleagues, if necessary, if it will provide assistance to help local authorities progress with this matter? Mm -hmm. I, I am aware of the comments that have been made by COSLA in respect of this, um, and uh, 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 the Chamber should be aware that uh, uh, Scottish ministers did introduce a 25% reduction in fees for voluntary registration in June 2015, uh, which reduces the costs of registration for local authorities. Uh, and registers of Scotland have also extended their keeper-induced registration programme to include publicly owned land. Now, it does mean that the majority, if not all, local authority housing stock will be entered onto the land register by registers of Scotland with no cost or resource implications for local authorities. So 2019 is a challenging target. We hope to get as many uh, areas of Scotland there uh, by that uh, target date as possible. Question three has not been lodged. Question four, Graham D. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it will bring forward legislation regarding the reintroduction of beavers. Cabinet Secretary. As the member will be aware, I set out the position on this on 11th December in answer to a written question. The date on which beavers will receive protection in line with the EU Habitats Directive and be placed on the list of protected species depends on the completion of the strategic environmental assessment process. The SEA was published for consultation on 12th December. It is expected that this will be completed and the Scottish statutory instrument laid in the first half of 2018. Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. But can I ask what progress has been made on a practical level developing an accompanying practical management uh, regime, whether this will be available for scrutiny alongside the secondary legislation and whether there will be a scheme in place to compensate anyone affected by serious and verifiable damage caused by beavers? Well, there is currently good progress being made on the development of practical management arrangements, which were part of the agreement made um, uh, at the start of this process. Our intention is that these arrangements should be sufficiently responsive and robust to actually prevent damage occurring in the first place. However, officials are indeed intending shortly to discuss with farmers and other land and fishery managers what sort of financial support may be appropriate where damage occurs and is attributable to beavers. Documents setting out the management regime and the associated financial arrangements will be made available for scrutiny alongside the secondary legislation when it is brought forward. David Stewart. Officer, is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the Trees for Life assessment of beaver release in Strathglass in my region? And could I meet the Cabinet Secretary to discuss this issue further? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm always happy to meet uh, David Stewart um, uh, in whatever, uh, on whatever subject he wishes to raise with me. Uh, I am aware uh, of the um, uh, campaign that Trees for Life is uh, running. Um, I am conscious that there are issues in uh, the members part of the world in relation to beavers. I expect that's exactly what he wishes to talk to me about, uh, and I will be happy to meet with him. John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is very aware of the illegal release of beavers in the Tay catchment area, which in its own way is a wildlife crime. What steps is she taking to stop uh, and discourage such illegal releases in future of beavers and indeed other animals? Uh, um, well, as, as John Scott may remember, when I made the announcement in the first place, I was very, very clear that I would not tolerate continued illegal uh, releases. The illegal release uh, uh, issue is, and people need to remember this, criminal activity and needs to be treated extremely seriously. Uh, I am conscious that we have two populations uh, uh, two major populations of beavers now in Scotland, one of which was there officially, the other which arose from an unauthorised release uh, in the first place. Uh, and needless to say, it is the one which has arisen from the unauthorised release which is causing the greatest difficulty. Uh, and that shows that without proper planning and management in the first place, uh, the release of any animal can create problems. Uh, and the problems that, they, uh, that are then created are more difficult to manage uh, in the longer term. So uh, we will be uh, uh, taking uh, decisive action when we understand that there are unauthorised or illegal uh, releases. Uh, and I hope the member will take my absolute word that we mean what we say. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the impact of Brexit on environmental legislation. 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are in regular contact at both ministerial and official level with the UK government on the potential impacts of the decision uh, to exit the EU. I met with Mr. Gove, uh, Ms. Griffiths, the Welsh Government's Cabinet Secretary for Energy, Planning and Rural Affairs, and officials from the Northern Irish Executive in November, where I set out Scotland's commitment to the core EU environmental principles of precaution, prevention, rectifying pollution at source, and the polluter pays principle. We actually met again last week, where I reaffirmed Scotland's ambition to not only carry over the status quo, uh, but to keep pace with Brussels to limit any potential divergence in standards. The Scottish Government is carefully considering whether any gaps could arise in existing domestic monitoring and enforcement powers that would need to be addressed to ensure Scotland maintains high standards of environmental protection. And I have asked the Roundtable on Environment and Climate Change for its views on where potential gaps may arise and ask them to provide a range of options and how best to fill them. Bill Kidd. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her kind and comprehensive reply. Um, here's the political bit. Does the Cabinet Secretary have confidence that the UK Government has the ability or possibly the desire to deliver what's been dubbed a green Brexit? And uh, what's envisioned as the political uh, potential impacts of Brexit on Scotland's environment, please? Well, I think it's fair to say that the quality and the depth of engagement by the UK Government since uh, June 2016 does make it very hard to judge the degree of readiness or commitment uh, and therefore it's impossible to be absolutely confident about an answer to that. How far an ambition for a green Brexit is shared among UK ministers I'm afraid I can't tell. However the Scottish Government does remain committed to engaging constructively and at meetings with UK ministers I do continue to press on matters of concern for Scotland's environment. Brexit mustn't provide an excuse to lower environmental standards. Um, current environmental standards should be maintained where it's in our interest uh, to set higher standards. We should be absolutely free to do that. Uh, recent dialogue, to be fair to the UK government, has been more constructive. Uh, however, there are still some unanswered questions, uh, not least in relation to devolved powers, which are currently exercised in the framework provided by EU law. And there's still no clarity on what type of future engagement, engagement in European agreements and institutions will be agreed or indeed on future funding guarantees. Question number six, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce plastic waste in the marine environment. Cabinet Secretary. The member will have heard my initial response to his colleague at question one. Uh, my answer to him would have been uh, in the same terms. Can I say, Presiding Officer, I'm heartened by the significant interest in marine issues being shown by not just the Tory members, but all members in this chamber. Miles Briggs the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can, she ask, can I ask this question specifically regarding any assessment which the government's made with regards to CBIN technology, a floating debris interception device powered by an underwater pump, which is now, I understand, being trialled in both England and 16 other countries. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that the use of such technology, while not wishing to take away from any of the focus around prevention of plastic waste entering our seas in the first place, could actually play a significant role in reducing plastic waste from harm harbours, marinas and shallow coastal waters. I, I thank the member for that question. It sounds like a promising piece of technology. We are uh, embarking on a marine litter uh, project. There is work being done um, with Arica having been identified as a case study area, area um, because there's very proactive community engagement there. Um, I will uh, ask a question as to whether or not this is a piece of technology which is being considered by that group. It may already be part of uh, what they're looking at. Question 7, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to a recent study which found that air pollution can increase the risk of birth defects. Cabinet Secretary. I am aware of the study referred to by the member. The Scottish Government recognises the impact that poor air quality can have on public health, especially for the young and old and those with pre-existing conditions. For that reason, we have, in partnership with others, developed the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy. It sets out a series of actions for government, Transport Scotland, local authorities and others to further reduce air pollution across all areas of Scotland. Colin Beattie. Would the Cabinet, uh, Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Scotland has the opportunity to be a world leader in the reduction of air pollution, in particular through steps such as the introduction of low emission zones? I would certainly hope that uh, Scotland, where possible, would become uh, a world leader uh, uh, on this as on other things. Um, we do face air quality issues in parts of Scotland that are principally local in origin. 
Uh, but transboundary pollution is also an issue. We will continue to play our part to reduce the impact of Scottish emissions, recognising our international responsibilities and working in partnership with other countries to learn and share expertise, which is something I am very, very keen to do uh, whenever I can. Thank you. That concludes environment questions. We move now to rural economy and connectivity questions. Question number one has been withdrawn. Question number two, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve rail services in the Renfrewshire South constituency. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government is committed to improving rail services in Renfrewshire South. We have, through the ScotRail franchise, delivered enhanced passenger facilities, such as the new waiting shelters, custom information screens, cycle, cycle parking, and new ticket vending machines at stations within the constituency. In addition, the car park at Johnson Station was expanded in 2015 to provide a further 80 spaces. In addition, over 475 million is being invested in Abellio Scott Rail's rolling stock, which will deliver major enhancements to train facilities and increase seating capacity by 23% by 2019 to support growth in our railways. Tom Arthur. I thank uh, the Minister for that answer and I very much welcome the Government's commitment to invest in rail services in Renfrewshire South. However, Presiding Officer, my constituents are concerned that improved services could be threatened by the UK Government's proposal to cut funding for Scotland's railways by £600 million, which is why I raised this issue previously with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, who informed the Chamber that the UK Government had failed to give a satisfactory explanation. Can the Minister update Parliament as to whether there has been any progress on this matter? And what support, if any, he has had from other parties in this chamber? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I thank the member uh, for the question. There has been a further update from Her Majesty's Treasury, which still leaves a shortfall of over £400 million. Pounds. And that is £400 million pounds short of not what the Scottish Government asks for or the Scottish Government demands, but it is coming directly from the industry. This is what the industry tells us they need in order for maintenance, operations, renewals and enhancements on the network in the future. And I am disappointed, I have to say, by the response by some in the chamber. I'm not surprised, I have to say, by the Tory response, which came back to me, of course, defending their colleagues uh, in Westminster. But I have to say, from some of the other parties, there has been no response. Almost three months, of course, when I wrote the letter to Labour's transport spokesman, and not a single response. He never writes, he never calls, presiding officer, but all members, regardless of party affiliation, should join with the Scottish Government. And they would do well to stand up for Scotland's railways against these savage Tory cuts. Who is it? Anyway. Question number three, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much Scotland's food and drinks exports were worth in the first nine months of 2017. Cabinet Secretary Ferguson. In the what? first nine months of 2017, HMRC estimates show that Scotland's overseas food and drink exports were valued at approximately £4.3 billion, that's uh, £4,300 million, pounds representing an increase of around £500 million, pounds, or 13%, compared to the same period presiding officer in 2016. 42% of these exports, worth around £1.77 billion, were to the EU. For food exports alone, almost 70% were to the EU. Apologies to the member. I think I cut him off mid-flow. David Torrance. Thank you, presiding officer. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Parliament as to the value of Scotland's farmed salmon exports, which countries are the best importers of Scottish farmed salmon, and does he share my concerns about such exports being held up at the borders due to a hard Brexit, a result which the Scottish Salmon, Scottish salmon Producers Organisation says would be a disaster? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, the member is correct. Salmon exports are extremely valuable. They were worth uh, £483 million in the first nine months of this year, an increase of 56% in value from 2000, a really quite staggering increase, with France being the number one destination. The EU remains the biggest single regional market for our salmon, importing £215 million in the first nine months of this year. And I do share the concerns that Mr Torrance expresses. A hard Brexit risks access to Scotland's biggest overseas regional food and drink export market and could risk uh, increasing the cost of exporting to the EU. Uh, the Scottish Government position remains clear that the whole of the UK should remain in the single market. If that's not possible, Scotland should, like Northern Ireland, be entitled to a special arrangement. Yeah. This is essential in order to maintain a successful and sustainable aquaculture 
sector in Scotland, and indeed for similar food sectors. Uh, Mr Torrance can be absolutely assured that I and my colleagues will continue to make these points to the UK Government at every available opportunity. Edward Mount. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to refer members to my register of interest that I'm a member of a farming partnership that produces food. The figures that the Cabinet Secretary replicate the figures and those are the latest figures in 2015 that £1.8 billion of Scotland's export went to the EU, where £4.1 billion went to the UK. That's £2.3 billion more, Cabinet Secretary. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe the UK single market in 2018 will remain more important to Scotland's food producers than the EU? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, of, of course, uh, all markets are important. That's actually why, in uh, working with Scotland Food and Drink, we are going to be doing even more uh, to build up further trade in the UK market. But, you know, the threat to the existing market at the moment uh, is to the EU. That threat is because of Brexit and the SSPS, uh, the SSPO, the, the salmon... Uh, producers' uh, organisation have uh, put forward a very clear set of concerns uh, which include an automatic inheritance, continuation of bilateral rights and obligations for the UK under existing I in international trade arrangements uh, with third non-EU countries, clear and reliable legal redress and dispute resolution mechanisms, a definitive position on the jurisdiction of courts, a clear and definitive position on arbitration mechanisms, continued harmonization of UK and EU laws, and others that I can't mention. None of these questions have been answered, presiding officer, uh, and we're very close to Brexit. So the loss, the threat to the market, which Mr. Mountain seems to think is not of concern, is of huge concern to the salmon producers and the UK market, it will continue and we will build on it further. Question number four, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Secretary of State for Transport to discuss cross-border rail services. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, Keith Brown, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, uh, met with the Secretary of State for Transport on the 3rd of July. I'm currently in an exchange uh, with Mr Grayling, the Secretary of State, regarding cross-border matters of mutual interest. In fact, today, uh, later on, I'll be signing off a letter uh, in, in relation to the East Coast Partnership. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for that answer. When Ministers next meet with the Secretary of State for Transport, can I ask them to raise the concerns of the, the hundreds of thousands of passengers who now use Lockerbie Station in the south of Scotland? As a direct result of the UK Government's current franchise and delays in awarding new franchises, those passengers for Lockerbie see more trains pass through the station than actually stop there. They still do not have a direct service early morning to Edinburgh. There are no services to the capital from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. They regularly suffer from overcrowding and they even find themselves banned from booking seats from Lockerbie to Edinburgh during busy periods. Will the minister raise the plight of those passengers and, and fight for extra services from Lockerbie station? Yes. I think the member raises a, a good point. Just as a bit of context, it's probably worth noting that uh, as he alludes to, the cross-border uh, franchises are specified and awarded by the UK government, by the Department uh, for Transport. Now, we have a generally good relationship with the DFT and uh, we look to input that uh, where we can. So I'll certainly take the points that he's raised and if he wants to formalise them and add to them uh, in terms of future West Coast uh, partnership franchise, I'll certainly do that. It's probably the worst thing at this point is because of this government's direct intervention that there are stops to Lockerbie and Motherwell uh, on the West Coast uh, main line uh, that uh, weren't there before. So wherever we can, of course, input into strengthening those services, then he has an absolute guarantee and an absolute reassurance from me uh, that we'll make that case to the UK government. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, any cross-border services will require extensive community buy-in. Uh, therefore, outreach uh, will be needed to ensure transparency and accountability. I wonder if the Minister could tell us how the Scottish Government is engaging with stakeholders uh, and community groups to ensure that any cross-border rail services meet their expectations. Mr. I think the member raises a good point. Again, it's worth uh, mentioning that, of course, these uh, contracts 
are specified and awarded by the UK government. We have uh, some limited uh, input uh, in that. We've already started conversations in the West Coast Partnership with the three bidders uh, that have, uh, of course, uh, been mentioned. It will continue to, of course, uh, exchange with, uh, ha have dialogue with MSPs across the Chamber. This is a very open invitation to any MSP that wishes to write to me about what their expectations are of future cross-border franchises. I'll certainly take that forward uh, with the appropriate UK Government Minister. Question number five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it will take regarding Northern Isles inter-island ferry services in light of the debate on 6th December 2017. Minister Hobbs Yusuf. Well, the 2016 SNP manifesto contained a commitment to, and I quote, take action to reduce ferry fares on ferry services to Orkney and Shetland. This Government is delivering on that commitment and that is our priority. The inter-island ferry service which the Member talks about, of course, are the responsibility of the local authorities. There was never an agreement that the Scottish Government would automatically fund right. the Council's financial ask. And there is no provision within the draft budget for 2018-19 for this topic. We, work we look to continue to work constructively uh, on this issue. And, of course, uh, there is an, a window of opportunity for other political parties to engage constructively. And I would ask the question that if the funding is in the budget, uh, will Rhoda Grant vote for it? A simple yes or no would, of course, suffice. Rhoda Grant. Despite promises made to the Northern Isles Council, the Minister has confirmed yet again today for the second time that there is not, no additional money in this year's budget, not a penny for the Northern Isles Inter-Island Ferry Services. Worse than that, there are huge cuts to Council budgets, making these services even more precarious. When will the Scottish Government implement their policy of fair funding for ferry services and stop playing politics with lifeline services? Minister. Well, she is, of course, wrong on the premise of her question. There has been a cash increase in the draft budget to local uh, governments, so they have been treated well. Now, there is a window of opportunity. Instead of reading from her pre-prepared script, she could have, of course, looked to answer my question, which was that if that funding is included in the finalised budget, Will Rhoda Grant vote for the budget? She said she will not. Well, she's saying from a sedentary position, presiding officer, that she would not vote for uh, additional funding for internal ferries. Well, there you have it. They are playing politics. Instead of standing up for their constituents, they are, of course, siding with their political party. Uh, Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, three years ago, the Transport Minister's predecessor, Derek Mackay, uh, informed me in this chamber that the provision of transport services should not place a disproportionate financial burden on any council, particularly with reference to revenue support for ferry services. Does Mr Yousaf believe that the lifeline uh, internal ferry services in Orkney, which uh, account for 14% of OIC's total annual budget, represents a disproportionate financial burden? And if not, why not? Minister. Of course, Orkney and Shetland Island Council receive additional uh, funding through their special islands need allowance. The member uh, is probably aware of that. But once again, I go back to this point that the promise made by the Scottish Government was to engage constructively in dialogue. We have done that, in fact, after the last meeting between myself, Derek Mackay, and the leaders of both uh, Shetland and, and, and Orkney Island Council, that the leaders of those councils said that that meeting was constructive, that the engagement was positive. Uh, what I would say to the member, of course, there is a window of opportunity. And on the fifth time of asking, would he vote uh, for that budget if, of course, it includes funding for internal ferry services, he has refused to say other that he would. Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just last week, in response to the member for Orkney asking, and I quote, when will the Scottish Government honour the commitment that it made in 2014 to provide fair funding for these lifeline services? The Economy Secretary responded that the commitment was made, and I quote again, as long ago as when I was Transport Minister and directly to the councils involved. So will the, cabinet, sorry, will the Minister now accept that there is a clear commitment from the Scottish Government to deliver, deliver fair funding for Orkney and Shetland's internal ferries? And will he advise us on how the Scottish Government plans to deliver on that clear commitment? Minister. Well, it's quite unbelievable the hypocrisy of a Conservative member yeah. standing here yeah. while they cut this government's budget by yeah. 500 yeah. million yeah. over the next two yeah. years, exactly, yeah. demand that we reduce taxes, and then demands that we put in funding for something that is not even this government's responsibility. Does the member have no shame or no understanding, of course, yeah. of how budgets tend to work? So once again, I'll present him with an opportunity, with an olive branch, if you will. If that money has been put in the budget by the time we get to the finalised budget uh, scrutiny and process, 
Will the member vote for that budget? Yes or no? So far, he's not said that he will. Minister, the questions are to you, not to the members in the chamber. <laughs> Question number six, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce overcrowding on trains. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government is committed to significant investment in new and refurbished rolling stock in order to reduce overcrowding. Since 2007, 160 extra carriages have been introduced to the ScotRail fleet, with an extra 200 carriages to follow in the next 18 months. Over £475 million is being invested in ScotRail rolling stock fleet during the franchise term. This includes new Class 385s, which will provide uh, almost 26% more capacity uh, when they operate on seven cars. When they operate in eight cars, that will be an increase of 44%. Uh, when we introduce uh, the 26 fully refurbished high-speed trains uh, between Scotland's main cities uh, from summer 2018, that will provide an additional 121 coaches. That's 40% uh, more seats. In the short term, the recent introduction of seven electric class uh, 380 trains operating on the Edinburgh Glasgow route, uh, that will see, uh, that will see uh, an increase uh, of uh, around about 9,500 seats uh, across the day. Gordon Linders. I thank the Minister for that answer, but what matters to commuters and those coming in to and from Edinburgh at the minute at this festive time of year is what is happening now. We have heard stories in recent weeks of customers fainting, bursting into tears and panicking as they are, and I quote, crammed in like sardines. So the question is, what is the Minister and the Government doing now to improve the rail passenger situation and make train services more efficient now? Minister. What I would say is, of course, uh, ScotRail are aware of the fact that during the festive period our trains are busy and they do what they can to strengthen services uh, where possible. And at the moment they're using uh, automated, uh, automated passenger counting system. That gives them a more accurate idea of where some of the services have a heavier load. Uh, an example of that would be, for example, strengthening the, 17, uh, the 717 North Berwick to Haymarket uh, weekday service from four carriages to six. So where they can strengthen services, they absolutely will. Well, there is an understanding, I think, from passengers and commuters that particularly during uh, the festive periods who get towards uh, Christmas and that last minute Christmas shopping and people travelling uh, rightly, of course, to, to winter markets and so on and so forth, there will be uh, more passengers uh, on our train service. And I would just say, uh, similar to my question, to my answer to his uh, colleague, uh, Jamie Halcourt Johnson, that I do find it a tad bit hypocritical that the Conservatives stand here demanding more money for our railways while simultaneously yeah. cutting the budget by hundreds of millions of pounds for the railways. Yeah. Yeah. Question number seven, Monica Lennon. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of integrated smart ticketing on public transport. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, smart tickets can now be used to make journeys on rail, uh, on bus, subway, tram and air. Uh, work pr is progressing with ferries. This means Scotland has one of the most advanced smart integrated multimodal public transport networks in the UK uh, outside of London. Integrated ticketing between the Glasgow subway and ScotRail, as well as the introduction of multi-operator bus smart zones in Aberdeenshire, Dundee and more recently in Glasgow with the hope that Edinburgh will soon follow in early 2018, uh, have proven successful and Transport Scotland is now looking to expand this cross-mode interoperability for the full saltire smart car estate. Uh, in addition, we are working with the industry to support the contactless bank card payment system to bring more convenience to the travelling public. Monica Lennon. Thank the Minister for that answer. Um, a constituent of mine from Hamilton has raised concerns over the delays in implementing an integrated smart card system for our railways. His worry is that the ScotRail smart card won't be as functional as Oyster or perhaps the SPT subway smart card and will have little advantage over paper tickets. I know the government has consulted recently and I wonder when the results will be published. And while the aim of having one form of ticketing is a worthy one, is the Minister satisfied that this proposal has been an effective use of money, especially when so many people are struggling to pay the increasing fares of transport operators such as ScotRail? Minister. Just on, on a final point, it's worth noting this government, of course, has capped any uh, increase in fares. But that being said, the, the points raised by Monica Lennon on behalf of her constituent are a very fair one. Uh, I think uh, the more integrated, the more seamless transport, uh, access to transport can be, the better for everybody. Uh, so therefore, uh, I should say smart uh, ticketing on ScotRail, the use of that has increased by 50% in the last six months. 2.4 million journeys are now done on ScotRail using smart. 
more and more of ScotRail's ticketing options are coming on to Smart. But as I said to the member, and I think uh, going by her, her, her supplementary, she probably agrees with this, that uh, a lot more focus is now going on to EMV contactless solution, which again will make that uh, system uh, even more accessible. So I'm more than happy to, of course, take further suggestions from Monica Lennon, her constituent and others. Uh, what I would say, uh, as she's rightly alluded to, the consultation has just closed uh, on this. And of course, I'll keep it update, updated on the analysis. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister and members. That concludes portfolio questions. We'll now move on to a statement on the Scottish Energy Strategy. We'll just take a few moments to change seats.